This evening we conclude this message series called Great Expectations and we have seen the expectations that people like Noah or Andrew or Hannah, Samuel, Cain and Abel, Abram had about promises that God gave to them and how they would be fulfilled and how that helped us in our own expectations about what God has promised to us. And then we explored last weekend the expectations that come with the title Emmanuel. And now we're going to explore the expectations of that name above all names, Jesus. What we are going to celebrate in less than four days is when you get down to it, birth of a baby. And one of the first things that is done when a mom and dad are expecting a baby is to start to think of names for the child. And that is a great expectation, the name of the baby. In my family, there wasn't much to think about in naming the first boy. My grandfather's name was Ed. My dad's name, Ed. My granduncle on my mother's side, so my grandmother's brother was named Ed. And of course, I am named Ed. And you guessed it, my oldest son, our firstborn, is named Ed. In a way, five Eds are better than one. It's a long way to go for that joke, but I like making it all the time. But Nancy and I had to think about what to name our subsequent sons in our family. Early on, I was able to convince her to name our other two sons after my best friends, and really, they're my brothers. We're all brother pastors in the church and have been serving the church for over 25 years in various locations and in various levels in the church. And you have met these guys. They have been here to sing. We have been singing together since 1984. We were known as the Master's Voice. And now we seem to have found a niche in singing the national anthem at baseball games. So Nancy and I named our middle son, Kurt Stephen, named after Kurt Taylor and Steve Klein. And then our third son is named Mark Jeffrey. He's the one in the White Sox outfit, and he's named after Mark Sheltanis and Jeffrey Meyer. And these names are important to us, not only because they are our son's names, but because they come from a deep love for family, both blood relation as well as spiritual. And I'm sure that there is some kind of story of the naming of a child in your own family as well. And when it comes to Jesus, there is a story to his name. Mary was the first one to know she was going to be a mother, which is usually the case. Joseph was most likely the second to know. However, they did have different reactions to the news. But they were given the same answer to the news when they started asking questions about it. When Mary was told that she was going to be a mother, the mother of the Messiah, no less, her reaction was one of astonishment. And she asked a question, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel Gabriel told her that the Messiah she carries will be the Son of God because God is the Father. But not only did Gabriel tell her, you're going to have a baby and it's going to be a special baby, but she also tells her what to name this child. Now that was an unexpected twist. You see, in that time period, in that culture, it was the father's responsibility and privilege to name the child. But I guess in a way, that's exactly what happened. It just wasn't going to be Joseph. God the father named his child. When Mary told this story to Joseph, <laughs> He had a, a different reaction. His reaction was one that we more readily would expect. You're more than fiancé, but less than wife just tells you she's pregnant, but you're not the father. How would you react? Exactly. Yet because of Joseph's piety and integrity, which compels him to end the relationship, it is somewhat overridden by his love for Mary. So, as we're told, 
he resolves to divorce her quietly because he would have been well within his rights, morally and in accordance with God's law, to have Mary stoned to death for her supposed unfaithfulness and immorality. But Joseph opts instead for the less extreme option. And then he decides apparently to sleep on it. It doesn't say that he went to sleep, but it does say he woke up from sleep. So I figured he most likely slept on it before he made any deci final decisions. And before carrying it out, an angel visits Joseph. And what Gabriel tells Mary, Joseph now hears. This child is God's child. It is the Messiah, long promised. And then Joseph is told also, you are to name him Jesus. Because in a way, Joseph will be the father of Jesus, just not the biological father. And then Joseph is given a little bit more than Mary. In addition, Joseph is told why to name him Jesus. So we see that Jesus' name was given to him, not by his mother or his father, earthly-wise, but by his father in heaven. And actually, Jesus' name is given to him earlier, before Mary and Joseph ever found out about him. A lot earlier. The first promise of the long-expected Jesus was in the Garden of Eden, recorded in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and this woman, God tells the devil, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The context of this promise is that this offspring, a baby, a child born from a human mother, will overturn sin brought into the world by Adam and Eve through the temptation of Satan. This would happen through pain and sorrow, something I will touch on Christmas Day, by the way. And in other words, this baby born would save everyone from their sins. This child's name is Jesus because Jesus means Yahweh saves, or to put it in modern English, the Lord saves. It will turn out that Jesus is literally who his name says he is. In the interest of being accurate, his name really isn't Jesus. Okay. It's Joshua, actually. We get Jesus from the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for Joshua, which is Yeshua. And while it seems that Joshua is a more common name than Jesus, in the Bible there are actually only three other Joshuas. The most famous Joshua of all is Joshua the son of Nun, N-U-N who was Moses' successor and would lead the people of Israel in the conquest of the promised land, Canaan, starting with the Battle of Jericho. He lived up to his name, the Lord saves, because he was right there in the front of the army as God saved them time after time and then let them to be defeated to teach them a lesson when they didn't trust in him. And so they took over the promised land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's another Joshua, though. When the Jews returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuilt the city walls and the temple in Jerusalem, and Joshua was the high priest who organized the group that was tasked with putting the temple back together. It wouldn't be completed for another 400 years under King Herod the Great, but there's your second Joshua. Jesus is the third, and then there's a fourth one. The third one, other than Jesus, is in the book of Acts. In some translations, it will be Elimus. In other translations, it will be Bar Yeshua, the son of Joshua. But he does not live up to that name, as he is an enemy of the Christian church. By far, Jesus is the most famous Joshua of all time. But his name is more than just a reference to God saving us like it was with Joshua, son of Nun. Jesus is God who saves us. Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Still not everyone believes that. Starting in about the late 3rd century AD, some Christian leaders started to question him whether Jesus actually was the Son of God, that is, was God, or if he was actually equal to God the Father. And this teaching was championed by a man named Arius. And he gives his name for what we know today as the Arian heresy. My favorite story about 
Arius is actually connected to Christmas, believe it or not. It is that at the Council of Nicaea, where Arius was on one side and, and the other Christian leaders were on the other, and they were debating this. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus equal with God the Father? Arius, of course, is saying no. There was another member of the council there by the name of Nicholas. And he was so irate with this that he got up and he ran over to Arius and he punched him in the face. This Nicholas would later be known as Saint Nicholas. In Belgium, in the, ne in the Netherlands, he's known as Sinterklaas. And here in the United States, he is known as Santa Claus. I love this story. It seems as if Santa Claus, who's known for bringing presents, ran out of presents, so he, st he stuck to punching heretics in the face. The Arian heresy that Jesus is not God, or at the very least, not equal to the Father, as we confess in the Athanasian Creed, he is, today finds a home in three prominent religious groups. The Unitarians, the Mormons, and the Jehovah Witnesses. But we're in a Lutheran church, and as Lutheran Christians, we believe, teach, and confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he is true God and true man, and we believe that Jesus literally is his name. The Lord saves. That was first promised in the Garden of Eden. The Lord saves. That was further promised to Abram and Isaac and Jacob. The Lord saves, promised to Moses, David, and throughout Isaiah and the prophets. Then on that holy night in Bethlehem, 2,026 years ago, it was announced by the angel of the Lord to the shepherds, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, Messiah, Yahweh, your Savior. And almost 2,000 years ago, now that baby grew up into a man. And he lived perfectly, not one sin in his life, so that he could be your righteousness by faith. He died on the cross to forgive all your sins and all the sins of all the people of all time. He truly is. The Lord saves. He was expected by Adam and Eve. He was expected by Noah, Abraham, Joseph, David, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was the expected one from the very beginning. And in fact, from before the beginning, as John, in his introduction to his gospel, tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And for you and me, Jesus, the Lord saves, is the one we should expect at the end of all things. And the same John who wrote about the beginning and the Word wrote about that in Revelation as well. John's final expectative prayer is ours as we conclude this series called Great Expectations. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.